Good morning, Mercy Vineyard Church family. We're so glad that you've joined us for our morning service. Uh, happy Father's Day to all the dads out there and all the father figures. We appreciate you and thank you for being in our lives. This is also Juneteenth. So we celebrate this African-American holiday as well, celebrating the end of slavery in the United States. After slavery was abolished in 1863 uh, with the Emancipation Proclamation, many African-Americans actually remained enslaved until what was considered to be the end of the Civil War in 1865. Texas was the last state in the Confederacy to uphold slavery and had become a safe haven for slave owners to relocate and illegally harbor their human currency, the enslaved. On June 19th, 1865, the U.S. Major General Gordon Granger, he gave a public announcement of emancipation to the people of Texas. And a year later, the formerly enslaved people of Galveston, Texas, they gathered together one year later to celebrate freedom. For African Americans, Juneteenth has become a holiday that celebrates freedom for all people, heritage, and hope. You see, Juneteenth is an all-American holiday because it is inclusive. It's inclusive of all of us. It is a celebration of the day that we were all set free, by national legal standards, that is. You can learn more about Juneteenth, and I hope that you celebrate Juneteenth with us this week. Actually, Monday is the national holiday. So celebrate and click this link on the side of your screen if you want to learn more about Juneteenth. Now, today we are continuing our series called We Are Vineyard. You see, we are a movement of people who want to learn to live like Jesus lived not just believe like Jesus believed. And this week, uh, this week, we are starting to look at some of the distinctives of our movement. What separates vineyard churches or what makes vineyard churches vineyard churches, right? Today we have an extra special guest, Pastor Kathy Maskell. She's a, the lead pastor of the East Denver Vineyard Church. She joined that church in 2020 in the midst of a global pandemic. Who else knows about joining a church in the midst of a global pandemic? So we are kindred spirits. We are good friends. And she also leads the Vineyard Justice Network. And she's also served as an executive board member for Vineyard USA, our national vineyard board. She is my friend who I look up to and I honor. And I'm so blessed to always be in communication with her and to even have her as a part of this series to share more about justice and caring for the poor today. So would you help me to welcome my dear friend in the ministry, Pastor Kathy Maskell. Hi, Mercy Vineyard. My name is Kathy Maskell. I'm the lead pastor of East Denver Vineyard, sending you greetings and love from the heart of Denver. And Pastor Gary was so kind in inviting me to share some stories as a part of your Vineyard Values series. And I just want to highlight the Vineyard value of compassionate ministry and leaning towards kingdom justice. So in the vineyard, vineyard churches are exhorted and expected to lean towards the lost. We lean toward the poor, the outcast, the marginalized, the outsider, because it is rooted in our own experience of the mercy and kindness of God. And I love that in terms of just the heart and spirit of so many vineyard churches that I've been a part of this lean towards compassionate ministry, leaning towards the poor and the outcast, uh, comes from our own experience of being healed and liberated by our loving Father God. God did not first assess whether we were blameless in the situation or uh, we only get helped by God as long as it was someone else who was to blame. 
Instead, God looks on us with the eyes of mercy, with the eyes of love, and he acts from compassion, which means to, to come from the guts, to come rooted from your bowels. I almost even imagine like that deep place of your womb, deep within, that he's moved from the depths of his being to rescue us from the kingdom of darkness, no matter how we found ourselves there. And as grateful people, as people who are postured in the kingdom from a place of gratitude, where we know the joy of our salvation, we humble ourselves in judging others and freely give, freely serve, freely lean towards the poor and the marginalized and the outcast. In, in the vineyard, we are seeking to be a movement of thankful people so that when we see someone in need, our hearts delight to respond. John Wimber is known as the founder of the vineyard movement from the early 80s. He, he planted his own local vineyard church in Anaheim. And as I've studied uh, his legacy and his ministry, I've been so struck by some of the ways that he cast vision and sought to set culture in his own local church. He was known to, to say to people who would come to him to ask if they could plant a vineyard church or adopt their churches into the vineyard. And he was so blunt, he would say, well, if you're not going to care for the poor, do not use the vineyard name. He, he would directly challenge middle-class values and the way that that tends and skews towards comfort and security. Uh, John Wimber said that today in the church, because of our, of our culturally derived perspectives, we've emphasized prosperity to the de-emphasis of ministry to the oppressed poor. As the redeemed in Christ, we can expect to prosper, but we get to give. To get to give. And what I've been able to see through the leadership of so many different vineyard pastors and leaders across the country is that the poor are reflections, are the face of Jesus to us. Matthew 25 verse 40 so clearly says, uh, this is Jesus talking, whatever you did for the least of these brothers and sisters of mine, you did for me. So we do not have an option of seeing the poor as underprivileged or needy or irresponsible. We have to see the poor as Jesus. Another saying in the vineyard is that faith is spelled R-I-S-K. Uh, one of my dear friends and mentors, Jordan Sang, he has been trying out a new definition. Uh, faith is spelled T-R-Y, try. And I love how these two things code together. Faith is spelled R-I-S-K and T-R-Y. And there's so much freedom in that for us to try and to take a risk in moving towards those who are the most marginalized, the most vulnerable, those who have complicated stories in our own churches and in our own communities. I want to highlight just a few stories of how the justice of God's kingdom is at work through some local vineyard churches. Isn't it so heartbreaking that the church these days has this reputation as the place where the broken are running away from her? In truth, shouldn't the church be the safest place for the broken and the hurting and the outcast to run towards it? I am so grateful for creative ways that vineyard churches are demonstrating how justice and mercy go together, that it is God's mercy 
that leads us to kingdom justice, not God's judgment that leads us to justice. It's God's mercy that leads us to justice. And, and the reality is that means that vineyard churches have to be comfortable with mess and holding tension and moving towards crisis, moving towards complicated situations. Let me tell you a story about Dave Hansen, who is a co-pastor at the Yakima Vineyard in Washington. And within those first few weeks of COVID, their community had the highest per capita infection rate for four weeks. And for the folks who were unhoused or who were living in the shelter and were taken to the hospital, if they tested positive for COVID, no one would give them a ride back to the shelter or to find housing. And so Dave and Yakima Vineyard and their community center had an opportunity to practice the radical mercy of the kingdom. And so do you know what they did? The shelter director of their community center picked up an old ambulance that had an air filtration system. And so they moved towards the crisis they move towards to try to figure out how do we step in where others are refusing to step in. And they were the ones that brought them back to the shelter. They were the ones that helped them to find housing. Yakima Vineyard practiced radical mercy in leaning towards the outcast as a demonstration of kingdom justice that prefers and gives a preferential treatment to those who others don't want to touch. The Ann Arbor Vineyard a couple years ago demonstrated radical mercy to someone who was in a really messy situation. There was a young man who was in jail and he was requesting help from a small group in the church and it would cost $4,000 to release this man this young man from jail. So here's the thing, the small group brought this situation to the pastoral team and together they contacted the young man's parents to let them know that the church was willing to secure the funds to get their son out of jail. But the parents were hesitant. The parents were not necessarily sure that they wanted their son to get out of jail because they had a thought that maybe jail would teach him a lesson. They were out of mercy because of how this young man had gotten himself into this situation. But the church, the small group members worked together to secure the funds to have him released six months before his incarceration was supposed to end. And when he was released, the church and the members of his small group were able to help him out to find employment, to find housing. Yes, the man was guilty of the crime, but the church chose to pay his fines and free him as opposed to leaving him incarcerated. Uh, my little church plant, we're about 60 people on the weekends, or about 100 people in our church. During the pandemic, what we bore witness to was an explosion of homelessness. And I have unhoused neighbors. Many of the people in our church have people who are living in tents just a few blocks away from where they live. There's lots of different reasons why homelessness has skyrocketed in Denver. People literally cannot afford to be in a house. And so there's an initiative called the SOS, Safe Outdoor Sites, that are providing safe places and safe spaces for people to live in tents. These are regulated spaces where folks get meals three times a day. There are clean bathrooms. There are showers available. There are resources for getting people into long-term housing. And I just love that even with the stage of our church, we can say yes to an expression of radical mercy. Brian Stevenson, who's been a tremendous 
inspiration for me that says that hope is our superpower. And so I pray that hope be your superpower and that radical mercy be the antidote to the division that is continuing to run rampant in our society that would seek to tear our churches apart, to tear our communities apart. So I pray that your practices of mercy and justice would be an antidote to division in your community. Thank you, Kathy, for sharing with us. Now we'll talk about another Vineyard Distinctive. It's called Everyone Gets to Play. Listen, I loved watching baseball as a kid. I, I, I grew up around baseball. I lived in Baltimore, Maryland, so we had a pro team. I really enjoyed attending the games with my dad way back in ancient history when our team was actually good. It's been like three decades since they've been good. God, help us, please. I'm going to have to choose my new team, the, the, the uh, Minnesota Twins. How about that? I know that uh, we all cheer for the Twins, right? Well, listen, I not only like watching baseball as a kid, but I love to play baseball. I wasn't the best by any stretch of the imagination, but I do have to, I believe at least, that I was good at batting, at least in practice. You see, when it came to the games, I would freeze up and, and, and just not swing or whatever. And I remember one of the reasons for that as I tried raced my memory lane, going down memory lane, thinking back on my childhood. I remember one of my coaches, he was so discouraging to me. Instead of helping me to get better, instead of helping me or giving me tips, I remember hearing him in the background talking to some other coaches and talking to other people uh, about my skill level or lack thereof. Uh, that was heartbreaking. And, and this is Little League, for goodness sake. You need to help the kids to get in the game, right? and to be better at what they're doing. Uh, I remember one game where the coach didn't show up. And so, uh, you know, the, the guys, we all got together and we decided to coach ourselves because otherwise the umpire was gonna allow us to forfeit the game. And so we put together our own batting lineup and I remember one of the, the, the guys on the team, his name was Mark, I'll never forget, he screamed out, we need Gary in there. And so the team agreed to put me third in the batting lineup instead of last. And I felt so good about myself. I felt wanted. I felt noticed. I felt like I was a part of the team, that my team wanted me and needed me for what they knew I could bring to the table, but I was never given the chance to bring to the table. You see, playing in the game, is so much more fun than sitting on the bench, sitting on the sidelines and watching the game. It's so much more fun to be in the action. I remember uh, those younger days, right? Just, just getting in the game, you feel so much better about yourself. You see, too often, my story kind of reflects our Christian experience. Sometimes we sit on the sideline or, or, or even forced to sit on the sideline in some cases just to watch the game, right? Sometimes we watch others do the stuff. We watch others do the stuff that Jesus did, like pray and preach and teach and serve and worship and heal and care and give generously. We love to talk about our church when, when others are engaging in the community and others are uh, uplifting the community and doing great things. But when people ask us about what we're doing, oftentimes we cower uh, away and or even make up a story about how we're so involved without actually being in the game. Did you know this? That Jesus invites us all to participate in the game, in ministry, to do the stuff, the same stuff that he did. Yes, He wants all of us to pray. He wants all of us to heal. He wants all of us to preach, to teach, to reach others, to care for the poor, to free the incarcerated, to care for those who are marginalized. Nothing that Jesus showed us to do is designed only for staff, members of churches, or clergy. 
No, the ministry is for us all to get in and play our God-given roles where, where we have gifts. You see, he's given all of us gifts and passions to participate in ministry, to further his mission, not to pontificate about the ministry. He's has given us a, a great gifts and he's designed us to build up the ministry and build each other up, not tear each other down. He wants us to participate in good works, to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth, not to wait till we get to heaven to experience it. The Apostle James says it this way in chapter 1, verse 22. He says, be doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. Here in the vineyard, we believe that everyone gets to play. And that's so exciting. It's so exciting because the Holy Spirit can empower anyone to do what Jesus did. I believe we experience God moments, more God moments, when we're actually participating in the game. More moments when the Holy Spirit does something special that we weren't expecting. More moments where God's speaking to us and letting us know how much we are loved and cared for in those moments. The Apostle Paul wrote this in 1 Corinthians, he actually uses this illustration of a body to illustrate the function of our church or our gathering together. He says in verse 12, just as a body, though one has many parts, but all its, uh, all its many parts form one body, so it is with Christ. For we were all baptized by one spirit so as to form one body, whether Jews or Gentiles, slaves or free, and we were all given the one spirit to drink. Even so, the body is not made up of one part, but of many. You see, you are a part of the body of Christ. If you are a believer in Jesus, you are a part of that body. And guess what? We need you. We need you to get in the game. We don't want you to sit around or sit on the sideline and wait to be noticed or wait to be asked to get in the game. No, the game is for everybody. It, the, doing the stuff that Jesus did is for you and me, for all of us. We want you to take some initiative to get in the game because this is your church. You are a part of the Mercy family. This is your team. There are plenty of opportunities for you to get involved and use your gifts here at Mercy. So why not try out something new? Why not use your gifts uh, for the advancement of this body and watch the Holy Spirit meet you there? The beauty of the kingdom is that everyone has their own role. Everyone has their own gifts that God has given. And when we bring it all together, when your gift matches with my gift and my gift matches with her gift and his gift, and we all come together, watch this, watch this. Our efforts reveal the beauty of what God is doing in the world and what he, he's actually uh, ultimately going to accomplish or bring to a completion. That's the kingdom. That's what we talked about last week. So if you didn't see last week's message, you want to go, go to YouTube and uh, see last week's message or listen to last week's message so as we talked about the kingdom. See, the Holy Spirit is for everyone. He leads us to bring the kingdom of God through our good works. Everyone gets to play. Everyone has different gifts, different callings, different, different things to bring to the table. When we each do our part, and work those gifts together. I believe the light of the kingdom will shine in the darkest places in the Twin Cities. I honestly and truthfully believe that. There is darkness in so many areas of our cities, right? Darkness in economic equality, darkness in racial relations, darkness in affordable housing, darkness in mentorship, and, and, and kids having uh, people to look up to in relational development. Bringing the light to those dark situations in our city is what we are here for. I believe that mercy has a part to play and that when we bring our gifts together, we shine the light of Jesus in the darkest places and we help to raise people up and make our city even better. Using the gifts that God has given this body, 
We want to bring light and life into our city. And we can only do that together. Ephesians chapter 4, verse number 11 through 13. I'll read it quickly for you. It says, So Christ himself gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors, and teachers to equip the people for works of service so that the body of Christ may be built up until we all reach the unity in the faith and in the knowledge of the Son of God and become mature, attaining to the whole measure of the fullness of Christ. John Wimber, who is the founder of the Vineyard Movement, uh, he had an incredible conversion story. I'm not going to tell you his whole story, but I do love this part of his story, is that God delivered him. He brought him out of drug addiction and alcoholism and, and so much stuff. And when he was invited to a church, he went to the church with a friend, and he sat down and he listened to the sermon. And uh, after the sermon, he asked the pastor, he said, so when do we get to do the stuff? And the pastor said, what? What do you, what do you mean, the stuff? He said, that stuff that you're preaching about, that, that stuff that Jesus did, when do we get to do it? And the pastor said, that's old, that's, that's thousands of years old, that's the stuff that Jesus did, uh, that stuff's not happening these days. He said, I quit drugs for this? I want to do the stuff that's in this book. That is my favorite John Wimber quote. I quit drugs for this. And you know what? That situation, that encounter with that pastor, it encouraged him to develop this passion to equip the body. That's right. The goal of the vineyard has always been this, to equip you to do the stuff, to do the work of the ministry. And God has created each one of us to do good works. And the Vineyard Church staff is employed to develop and train ordinary people to do extraordinary things. That has, that's been the idea of the Vineyard, uh, uh, behind the calling of the Vineyard movement uh, uh, since its inception, since John Wimber had that uh, epiphany, if you will. It's our job as a staff to coach you into ministry, to coach you to do the stuff that Jesus did. You see, it's not valuable to sit on the sidelines and listen to a message and just sing along with a song. Oh, that's great. But it's valuable when we listen, learn, and do the stuff that Jesus did, when we put it into practice. It's not just the shepherd's responsibility or staff's responsibility to do the work of the church. No, it's all of ours. It's our responsibility uh, to get in the game and work things out together. Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, Jesus tells all of his disciples, all of his followers to do what? Go and make disciples. Not just the, the, the pastor, not just uh, the church staff, but all of us should go and make disciples or operate in our gift so that we can make that easier for each other. You see, everyone gets to play. That's why we even do big church here at the Mercy Vineyard Church, so that multi-generations can come together and play together, that our kids can learn to pray and preach and teach, that our teens can learn that they're not cast on the side, that they can get in the game and see people healed and pray for people and do great things, that every generation can participate, every culture can participate, every ethnicity, no matter your background, no matter what your belief status is, we invite you in to help out to get into the game. Because we believe that the Holy Spirit will impact your life when you do so. I've seen so many people's lives transformed because they got in the game before they even believed. They belonged before they believed. And that encouragement, that community actually helped to transform their lives for Jesus. So let's all get in the game and help each other to play. Let's help our kids play. Let's help our friends and neighbors play. See, God is inviting you to become an active participant in the body. To quote the Vineyard's uh, new national director, his name is Jay Pathick. He said, Jesus loves watching ordinary people do extraordinary things. So will you take a next step with me this week? 
I want all, us all to take some time to examine ourselves. Examine where you are. And here's something for each one of you, every person out there. If you are not in the game, if you're not participating, if you're not doing, using your gifts to further a, a, a church ministry or Mercy's church ministry, what I want to ask you to do this week is to pray. Earnestly speak to God, talk to Him, and ask Him to show you where you're gifted, what your gift is, and watch Him reveal that to you this week. Trust and believe He will. If you are, uh, uh, you already know your gift, what I want you to do is to pray earnestly that God would reveal to you what area He wants you to serve in. Is that kids' ministry? Is that outreach? Is that uh, 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 teaching? Is that, uh, uh, what is it? What area, what, is it audio? Is it video? What area has God gifted you in? Get in the game. And listen, if you are already in the game, if you're doing this stuff, if you're putting your best foot forward, God bless you. Thank you for all that you're doing to further the kingdom of God. But I want you to pray as well. I want you to pray this. Ask God, how can I train up others? Or God, reveal to me another person that I can train up to do what I'm doing. And I believe God will manifest himself in a mighty way in Mercy Vineyard Church and the Twin Cities and beyond. If we all can come together as ordinary people, he will bless us to do extraordinary things. God bless you and let us get ready now for worship.